So there's been a recent buzz about the history of polygamy in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There's a number of influencers online who are saying that Joseph Smith never practiced polygamy, that this is something that was brought in by Brigham Young. Jacob Hansen, my friend and the host of Thoughtful Faith, has done a lot of work on this and has had debates on this and kind of has his ear on the ground to this subject. Jacob shares historical points that he believes shows that definitely Joseph Smith was practicing polygamy. Now, this episode is brought to you by Scripture Notes. As you've heard me say before, I love Scripture Notes. I use this as a study tool. I've used it for my book to do research. One of the things I love about it is the AI assistant, Daniel. I'll give you an example here. One of the subjects in my book is the brazen serpent. So I clicked on Helaman 814 here, a search on the brazen serpent, which has a reference to the brazen serpent. You click on the uh, link here and you see AI assistant, Daniel. I went to Daniel and I asked the question about using the entire Book of Mormon, giving an overview of the references to the brazen serpent. It's incredible what it offers you here. It actually brought in some additional references from the Old Testament for me. And so I get a concise outline of the references to the brazen serpent within the Book of Mormon and without. Try it for yourself. Go to scripturenotes.com. Here we go. All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host in this episode. We brought on Jacob Hansen, who's recently put out a video on his YouTube channel about polygamy and the, the idea of polygamy stopped or never existed, I guess, right, with Joseph Smith and with Brigham Young. Jacob, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me on, Greg. Okay, I stumbled a little bit on that. Jacob, I, there is a movement, certainly online, of people that are hammering Brigham Young, stating that there is a break between Joseph and Brigham. Everything stopped in terms of keys and priesthood authority, temple ordinances, doctrine, revelation. Everything stops between the two here. Why is this something that is so prevalent? Um, well, I actually think it starts with polygamy itself, okay? Um, polygamy is something that is just an uncomfortable topic for everybody. Um, e even in our church, like we don't, we don't teach that polygamy is a positive, like this is what God wants for everyone. It's the highest ideal. Even though church leaders have in the past, maybe taught that polygamy was the ideal. It's not, um, polygamy. I, I like to use the analogy of war. Okay. War is never like, it isn't the ideal, it isn't what God wants for his children, obviously, but it can be justified in certain circumstances. And so because there is this level of like, okay, discomfort with that, a lot of people want to try and disassociate it with Joseph Smith, right? They want to say this is some sort of an error that came later. And so that's kind of where it initially starts, but then it grows from there once you begin to say, well, if Joseph Smith never practiced plural marriage, and that means that Brigham Young is the guy who brought it up, and it wasn't inspired, and it's wicked, and it's evil, and then, well, if Brigham Young was wicked and evil, well, then how can we trust the temple ordinances that were developed under his, his tenure and all that kind of stuff? So it begins with, polygamy is uncomfortable, and then it ends with Russell M. Nelson is not a prophet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's I want to get into that a little bit later here. But so basically, it's the ability to continue to say, uh, I believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet. I believe in the first vision. I believe that the gospel was restored. I believe in the Book of Mormon. I believe in all of these things, except for this body that grows after it, which is the church. Yep. Right. I mean, how do you how do you believe? I mean, the well, I'll just go right into it. How do you believe that Russell M. Nelson is a prophet and holds the keys of authority if you believe it st all stops right after Joseph Smith? And does that seem like a good plan or is that just apostasy? It At the end of the day, this has been the same basic fundamental theory behind every breakoff movement since 1844. OK, Uh the idea is Joseph got it right, but then this line, the Brighamite church, as they call it, that's the one that went off the rails. Now, my question to anyone 
who wants now to be fair there is a an attempt to say well joseph smith he had it right and brigham young had something right the church did it fell into kind of what i'd like to call like a soft apostasy the fullness of the priesthood was taken away and we're in a sort of condemned state as a church. And that's the reason why the church is wrong about COVID and, and the church is wrong about these different things. And there was a priesthood ban. And so it begins to create a narrative in which they can say that any errors in the church, so far as they perceive them are a product of this sort of soft apostasy. Um, but the problem is, is that I think when you go to the historical evidence, first of all, Joseph did practice plural marriage. Um, and the other theories about some sort of a soft apostasy don't make any sense. They either have the keys or they don't. And, and they, yeah, you, you just, you call into question the authority of the church itself and, and the leadership of the church and you end up getting this really distrustful sort of, okay, we need to reform the church because I know better than the brethren when it comes to this. And it creates a schism within the church where sort of there's this bottom-up movement that knows the real story that the leaders aren't telling you. And it's yeah. a recipe for apostasy schism disaster in the church. Well, and this is what you always see. I mean, I've already been watching, you know, Michelle Stone and others. It's like that that is that is what you see. There becomes this spirit of apostasy that enters in. It's it's putting down the prophet, it's putting down te the temple. It's and it goes, you know, Jacob, it goes back to this idea that, that there seems to be this urge for people to push off a church. And I'm not talking about just with the, with Latter-day Saints. Right, this, this idea, the spiritualism, which is, yeah, I can have a direct relationship with God. Why does anything else have to exist? Get it out of the way, right? I've got the Bible, you know, or whatever for us. It's, you know, I've got the Bible and the Book of Mormon. I, I don't need, I can pray. I don't need this, the, the, the bride, right? I, speaking of polygamy, I don't need the bride, right? <laughs> and so we can, I, I let, let's, let's just, clear the path between God and me and stop with this idea of something that's in that's between us. It's it's what I like to call Mormon Protestantism, right? It's the same narrative that the Protestants had about the Catholic Church, right? It's that, hey, we can go and because here's the real problem they run into. If this church doesn't have the keys, where are the keys? Anyone who's a follower of Jesus Christ they're seeking the key holders. They're seeking, it, it's, it's part of our temple liturgy. You know, I am seeking true messengers from my father, right? That's what we seek. And Jesus Christ established that when he said, I give unto you the keys of the kingdom so that they can bind on earth and bind in heaven. And my big question to people is who holds them? And either Russell M. Nelson holds them or he doesn't. And if he holds them, then we listen to what he says and we, and he has the authority to dictate the way things work within the church, right? And so, but there's a more fundamental problem. The fundamental narrative is just false. It is simply false. Joseph Smith practiced plural marriage. And then after him, Brigham Young continued the practice. And I here's one of the ways I get around the whole polygamy stuff when people bring it up. I just say, Joseph was telling the truth. God commanded him to practice plural marriage. You can have questions as to why. I think he had a lot of questions as to why. There's a whole big discussion to have about it. But to just deny that it happened, it's to deny certain facts that I think establish this to where anyone who ever interacts with what I call a you know, polygamy denier, okay? Here is what they'll do. They'll ask you questions that you may not have the answer to, okay? And that's fine. Flat earthers can do the same thing. They could ask you some question like, why don't the planes fly over Antarctica or something like that? And you're like, oh, they don't. You're right. And it'd be faster if they did. And, and so all of a sudden it calls into question all these things. And there are some questions that you could ask that are maybe we don't have great answers to all the time. Um, but 
when you start to ask them questions, you end up realizing they have a whole lot more questions that they have either no answers for or really, really bad answers for. And if you want, I can I can go into a few of those. Yeah, let, let's go to that a little bit. I want to talk about that because they have to have some things that they're getting right or that there are, uh, you know, at least the people superficially are not, can can easily react to in order to fall into this trap, right? There, there's got to be some things where they're like, okay, well, I can see this. I can see that, uh, you know, Jacob too, for example, an interpretation on that and, and other things where where it's, oh yeah, yeah, that would make sense, right? Yeah, or, or a very good one is that Emma Smith in uh, later in her life denied denied that Joseph had practiced plural marriage, okay? Mm -hmm. So they're like, whoa, like, that's crazy. And it's like, all right, fine. Like we can deal with that. And and frankly, I think that there are explanations as to why that may be. One of my theories, I'm just going to put this out there just as Jacob Hansen's wild theory, is that if Joseph's marriages didn't entail sexual relations or she didn't think they did, she might not have thought that they counted as actual marriages. Or uh, it could be the possibility that she was just simply so heartbroken over it. It happened at the very end of her life that she just was like, no, I'm I'm not going to accept that. Right. Well, there's also the idea that what is a ceiling? You know, we, we you, you go back and because, you know, this is something I have looked at. It's they didn't fully even Joseph, I don't think, fully understood in the way that we do this order of family ceiling mm -hmm. at, to some degree. Right. It's like I, I, my understanding is he was even sealed to men. And and so it's like, well, what is this? It's like, oh, we are all the family of God. We all have to be sealed back to him through this process of ordinances and et cetera, what, what is this ceiling? What does that mean? And how do you do it? Right. Yep. It's like, it's like with baptism for the dead, where they went out and started baptizing for dead in the, in the, in the river and, you know, doing it over and over again. And, and it's like, there's not a full understanding of, of this new revelation. Agreed. And I think that, and it even gets more complicated when you start to realize that a lot of what is a lot of what is said about plural marriage is said later by second and third hand sources. And people are saying, oh, well, Joseph said this. And then another person says he said something different. And so it's a it's it's a whole rabbit hole that you can dig into. I highly recommend if you want to actually get into the real, just everything that we know, uh, Brian Hale's mm -hmm. uh, uh, multiple volume set on Joseph Smith's polygamy. His website, Joseph Smith's polygamy, has great resources. You're going to get the full story that we know. And when you end up, you end up, we know some things, but, but when you turn it around and you begin to ask some questions to the people who deny that he practiced it, they have to account for things like this. So I like to start off by saying, look, there's, there's a, there's a litmus test. Kind of like the book of Mormon is like sort of the litmus test for our church, right? If it's true, the church is true. If it's false, church is false. Section 132, if it was written by Joseph Smith, end of story, this whole, like he practiced mm -hmm. plural marriage because that's, he like that's what section 132 is about. So the first bit of evidence, a lot of things are second, third hand accounts or whatever. So let's what I did when when I did my debate is I said, I'm not going to rely on those. I'm just going to go to what we have that's contemporaneous and or first hand stuff. So in Joseph Smith's own journal on July 12th, this is the date that 132 was received. It says that he received this revelation in the presence of with of Hiram and William Clayton. Okay, so I like to ask them, what was the revelation that Joseph received on July twelfth, eighteen forty three? And their answer is like, well, it's um, it was on marriage, but it didn't teach polygamy. So they'll even get to the point that they admit that he received a revelation on marriage on July twelfth, eighteen forty three. Okay, hmm. so let's go on to the next one. Or uh, let me let me do that here. I actually have control of it. So not only did Joseph have it in his journal, but William Clayton had it in his journal. <laughs> William Clayton wrote, and William Clayton's journal is more specific. He says that we got this revelation on the order of the priesthood, and it talks about what was the revelation about? Well, William Clayton, in his contemporaneous journal, before any of this was a controversy, said that it was about plural marriage. Okay. So it's like, wait a minute, why? Why is this in Joseph's journal and in Clayton's journal? Okay, but we go on. So I always like to ask people this question. What happened in the August 12th, 1843 High Council meeting in Nauvoo? You just ask the question. Something happened to that meeting. Do you guys know what? 
Well, we can we can go on conjecture or we can look at the historical record. First of all, every single person that was in that meeting eventually practiced polygamy except for three people. Okay? Hmm. So those three people were Leonard Sobey, Austin Cowles, and William Marks. All of these people were not followers of Brigham Young. They didn't like Brigham. They were against this, against plural marriage. Okay? So what did those three people say? Well, actually, I'm going to first let me go to this. We'll, we'll get to what they said. But let's go to that meeting. What happened in the meeting? Well, what, we don't have to ask people later. We can look at actual contemporaneous journal entries from August 12th, 1843, where it says that Hiram, who was the one leading the council, was talking about the idea of brothers taking up their wives to raise up seed unto them like it was back in ancient Israel must again be established. This is the law of Leverite marriage, which is the t- it's polygamy. That's what Leverite marriage is. And so we know in that meeting, based on the contemporaneous notes of people that were there, that it was a talk about plural marriage given by Hiram Smith. And we can go on. So eventually, this is a really interesting one. Leonard Sobey is one of those guys who he never... Uh, he never embraced polygamy. Um, he's one of the three of the high council that did not practice. Yes, if polygamy. we go, if we go back up here, he's one of those three. He's the first one on this list. Is that Let guy up there, you- Thomas Grover, by the way, I, I'll just throw this out there. That That's my direct, uh, I'm a direct descendant of him. Oh, really? Thomas Grover? Yeah. yeah cool he was stuff. there. He could, he, your ancestor could tell you what was up in this meeting, but it's okay. <laughs> Cause we have the other guys who weren't even polygamists who told us what happened at this meeting. Mm-hmm. Leonard Sobe, we're going to get to his affidavit and what he said. And he said exactly what happened. But you also have William Marks and Austin Cowles. Now, Austin Cowles said uh, he's the one who basically came out and said uh, in the Nauvoo Expositor, hey, Joseph Smith taught polygamy. And he basically started quoting Section 132. Okay. William Marks, um, he ended up joining the RLDS. What he said, it's really interesting what he said. He said, yes, Joseph taught polygamy. But then right before he died, he told me, oh, I regret all this. It's like, uh, okay. So mm. he doesn't deny that Joseph taught polygamy. Austin Cowles doesn't deny it. And this is one of my favorite ones is Leonard Sobe. This one I think is just, it's just a bullseye. See the RLDS church for all of their history maintained that, um, that, that polygamy wasn't Joseph's thing, right? This is sort of Emma's group. Um, and so eventually in the 18, uh, I believe it was the 1870s or 80s, um, they started to basically kind of use this against the church. They're like, Joseph never taught polygamy, Joseph Smith III, they're all about this. And so there is this big debate. What a lot of people don't realize is that in the late 1800s, 1870s, 1880s, there's this big debate going on that's the same one we're having today. Did Joseph practice polygamy? One of the apostles of the RLDS church knew about Leonard Sobey. So he knew on this list, that Leonard Sobey was one of the guys in that meeting. And so he said, I'm going to go to Leonard Sobey and I'm going to find out what happened in that meeting. He goes there and this is what he says. He says, on or about the 12th day of August, 1843, Elder Hiram Smith read the revelation on celestial marriage. He's talking about section 132. That revelation did not originate with Brigham Young, but was received by the prophet Joseph Smith and read uh, in the high council by his authority. Why would Leonard Sobey lie? Yeah, so so what's happening then here is that the R- RLDS church is setting their story, their narrative on what happened, right? Because if they're if he's saying this right here, then there's obviously, this is already a thing, right? This is already a teaching of the RLD- RLDS church. This is, this is a thing that's happening already with this conflict. Yep. And there's another fun one. If you want to put it on the screen here. Um, So remember, there were people that knew what really happened and they knew that the RLDS was doing this. And Ebenezer Robinson, he wasn't in the meeting, but he wrote a letter to Joseph Smith III and was like, hey, you need to knock this off. And here's what he said. He said, Hiram Smith taught me the doctrine. He's like, having, he's talking about himself. He's like, having a perfect personal knowledge of these facts together with many others here not stated, a denial of them sounds like a great lie. I'm sorry it is so, but we cannot undo the past. Ebenezer Robinson was not a Brighamite. So my question is, why did Ebenezer Robinson write this letter? Why did Leonard Sobe write that letter? Again, if we're asking the question, what was revealed to Joseph on July 12th? We come back here. I got all these slides. 
if we ask what was was revealed on July 12th, 1843, remember that high council meeting starts a month after the revelation was received. So if you've just received a major revelation from God, what do you think they're going to talk about in the meeting? Maybe that revelation. And that's exactly what the historical record shows. What do you do with this? Like, yeah. this is now here's the other thing. I, it gets even worse because Austin Cowles is in that meeting. Austin Cowles is one of the people who a year later in the Nauvoo Expositor exposes that section 132 was read in the meeting. How do we know that? Because wait, say that again. He what? So Austin Cowles is in this meeting. Here's what happened. Austin Cowles hears this stuff and he doesn't like it. He's going, plural marriage? What the freak, man? So he's starting to have his doubts about all this stuff. He's thinking Joseph may be off the rails. And then what happens is, is William Law and Austin end up being the ones who, who in the, it, when they put together the Nauvoo Expositor, there's a bunch of stuff in there. One of the things they put in the Nauvoo Expositor was they wanted to expose polygamy. And so what they did was they said, Austin was like, I will go on record saying what happened in that meeting. I will expose what they have revealed here. Now, he doesn't say I learned it in that meeting specifically, but we know that he did. You want to know why? Because he starts quoting section 132 in the Nauvoo Expositor. He literally used the things. If you actually look at what he says, he's talking about section 132 specifically. When, okay. when is he doing this? In 1844, on May 4th, okay? So this is a uh, year agency, after What meeting. year did Joseph die? He died a month after this. Yeah, so May, June, June 27th. Yeah. So it, here's the thing. The polygamy deniers, here's what they'll ask you. Here's the question they like to ask. They go, hey, did you know when section 132 was first revealed? Yeah, that's to the what church? I've heard. Yeah. And they go, they say it wasn't until they were in Utah under Brigham Young. Dun, dun, dun. And it's like this big, like, gotcha moment. And then I go, yeah, except for the fact that I can read section 132 being quoted by Austin Cowles in the Nauvoo Expositor. And I have affidavits from the other people who were in that meeting who all said, yeah, we, it was read in that meeting. So it's like, why should I believe you over the people who were actually there and had no motivation to lie? Because they're going to be like, all oh, these people are all liars, they're all Brighamites. And that's, I knew they were going to say that. So that's why I said, I'm not going to use Brighamites. I'm going to use people that weren't even, that hated Brigham Young, who said the same thing. And the obvious thing that section 132 shows up in the Nauvoo Expositor in 1844. You can't say that, that, that section 132 is a later creation after 1844 if it's right here in black and white in 1844 before your eyes. So... Yeah, and again, that's the that's what you hear. That's the narrative, right? Brigham Young wrote it. He pretends it was it was by Joseph Smith, so that he can, you know. And again, it goes back to this whole idea of, well, there there's sex and power, and this is fallen men, and men will be men, and 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 you know, they're they're just going to go. They want a bunch of women. It, it's it's a cult environment. They want a bunch of women, so they're going to make this up and change. Mormonism into their own image. Right. And they and they hold that same attitude towards people like the Old Testament prophets. Jacob, uh, Abraham, Moses, in my opinion, I think there's a great case yeah, that he to, was two wives, at to least. the, to mm -hmm. the uh, both a Midianite and a Cushite. Um, and then you have the other issue. Here, here's a here's a fun one I like to ask. So polygamy is adultery in their mind. Yep. Yeah, it's adultery. It's wrong. Okay. So why did God get upset with David when David slept with Bathsheba, but not with all those other women he was committing adultery with? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, sure. it's like, um, wouldn't God have said something about all of that other adultery that was going on? Like, or did he just randomly be like, you know what? This wife is just one too many. <laughs> now they're what they'll probably do. I mean, I think the, I think the retort there is going to be Jacob too, and, and going back and, and under trying to interpret what is being said there. What is your take on Jacob too? My take on Jacob too is that what is being said there is that what David did do was wrong. I do I don't think that all of all of the wives of David were given to him by yes. the Lord. I don't think that he. Uh, my take is that there was that David's plural marriage was not wrong until he made it wrong mm -hmm. by going beyond what the Lord wanted him to do with it. Same and with Solomon. I, same with Solomon. Same with Solomon. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to 
I'm going to say that I'm not going to say that everything that was done with polygamy was always done properly. I'm not a believer in pro prophetic infallibility. I think there may have been things that were done wrong. Um, and I don't have a problem with that. But I also say one of the reasons I'm a Latter-day Saint is because we actually account for plural marriage and nobody else does. Hmm. And I think that it was, a again, it's a messy thing in my opinion in many ways, but I do think this, that in Jacob 2, it says that the purpose of it was to raise up seed unto the Lord. Okay. That doesn't mean have more babies. Everyone who thinks that like you're wrong, stop, don't say that anymore. That's not what it is. Cause you actually get more babies per woman in monogamy than you do in polygamy. But the difference is this, you have families that are incredibly dedicated to the Lord through the sacrifice of polygamy and the, and by the way, if people think that they're like, oh, it's just about like having a lot of sex with a lot of women. I'm sorry, you guys, if you want to have sex with a lot of women, there is a, there's a, people have sex with a lot of women all the time and they don't marry them, take them in and try and like have and take care of the children in the yeah, whole Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a whole other discussion because everyone says, you know, cause men are going to agree with it too there cause they understand their own sex drive. And so they're like, yeah, okay, yeah, guys are going to want this. I get yeah, it. I mean, until yeah, this could be horrible. The problem is, is that the stories that would start coming out from the men of how this is hell, honestly, it, it would, would come out and guys would be like, whoa, okay, wait a minute here. I, I see the superficial end of this. So, so I, going beyond this, wow, this is... I, and I, I, I had a really interesting experience. I got married at the same time that the show Sister Wives came out. And <laughs> here I am, I'm early in my marriage. And one of the things you learn when you get married is marriage, yeah, it includes the sex, but it includes a whole lot of other responsibilities and yeah, like responsibility. relationships and all sorts of stuff. Marriage and sex are not the same thing, mm -hmm. okay? And when, I sh when we watched the show Sister Wives, I was like, that poor guy. Like that has got to suck having to manage that dynamic. Like, I'm sorry if like, there's much better ways to do things here. So I ended up coming away and, and I understand it's a tough issue. I don't want to put it out there, but I'll say this, go look around in your ward at how many people, you know, who have blessed your life that came from those families. Mm -hmm. And you, I have no doubt that the polygamous generation of this church produced the core of this church to this day. Sure. Those families went through something that was extraordinarily challenging, that tested their faith with a unique kind of family structure, and that put certain priesthood leaders over these very dynamic and 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 unorthodox family structures, but out of it, what by their fruits, you shall know them. And when you see all those people who have those classic last names, okay, including all of you people who love Mitt Romney, even though I have my issues with him. Okay. Remember it was Romney is a very close descendant of polygamous people. Mm -hmm. And what came out of the polygamous world is us. And I can't help but say that when I look at the history and all that went down with that, that's what made us who we are as a people. And I may have my issues with it. I may have things where people have done it wrong, but it's how we got here, ladies and gentlemen. Like this is, that's what built the Latter-day Saint yeah. people. And it is, it's messy. It's just, it's, it's messy. It's messy while it's happening. It's messy looking back in history. It, it's Pandora's box. I mean, it's, it's, it's it, when you all put sex in the middle of all of this, it just, it makes it so difficult to handle and to deal with, which is why this was such a massive test for them yes. all the way around. The men have their own test. Obviously the women have their test with all of this. And it, but you know, what, what is it uh, compared to the, uh, the, the, the sacrifice of Abraham and Sarah, right? It's, it's, you're going to be tested like Abraham and Sarah. Mm-hmm. And I, and, and, and at the end of the day, whatever someone's feelings are on it one way or another, there is just what happens when you reject this. Okay. If you say, cause it starts off with like, okay, I just want to reject this one thing, 
right? I'm not comfortable with it. I want to say that it's wrong. And so you want to push it off, but this creates, this is where the real sort of danger begins. I said it begins with polygamy makes me uncomfortable. And then you start to say, well, I'm not going to accept these historical facts because it's just too painful to me. And then before you know it, it's like, okay, well, what are the implications of that as far as the temple? Because remember, if you want to reject 132, did you know that the ceiling of families, the idea of eternal families emerges from section 132 as well? Yeah, and this is this is something that I actually I've got the notes here. This is exactly where I wanted to go with this because uh, you know this is some, this is a place where I focus a lot on and talk a lot about and and I, people don't understand it. And this is a problem in the church, and it's why something like this uh, can gather so much steam because we're not rooted in the scriptures enough. We are not rooted in a position where we understand the history of the church and the scriptures and how they are rooted in the temple. You can go through everything. I mean, before Joseph Smith ever even gets his hands on or, or even sees the golden plates, Moroni is telling him and quoting Malachi 4, mm -hmm. talking about the, the, the fathers turning the hearts of the children, the children of the fathers, etc. That That is the ceiling. This is the very begin, right from the get-go, before there's even a church or priesthood or a Book of Mormon, Moroni is talking about the temple. He is talking about sealing. And this is found throughout Joseph's journey, way before he's in Davu, way before he, he deals with the Masons. It, it is a, it's, it's in Abraham everywhere, in the Book of Abraham. And, and and we don't understand that. We don't see the temple in all of the scriptures. If Michelle understood those scriptures, she could not deny that the temple was integral to all of, including Jacob and, and, and Isaac and Abraham, et cetera. It's everywhere. So it's funny. This is where so much begins to be unraveled, and you end up realizing that it unravels the things that are right at the very heart of the church. Here's the thing. What is the church? The church, fundamentally, is this... If we don't have the keys, then we don't have the church. We have a really fun Bible study and church study group, but we don't have the keys of the kingdom. The whole purpose of the apostles is that they hold the keys to do what? To bind on earth and in heaven. How is that done? through covenant relationships that are put in place by priesthood authority. What is the highest covenants that we can make? They're the temple covenants of sealing ourselves to our to, to each other, basically, through husband and wife, to children, and then extended and, and around, right? The sealing, that's the what was restored. We talk about the restoration. What is being restored? It is the keys to seal families together eternally in the temple. That is the unique doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. A lot of churches have baptism. They have, they have repentance. They have all that stuff. What do we have? We have those keys that bring that back that are vested in a, in a restored quorum of 12 apostles like that existed anciently. And if you think about it, what matters more to your in your life than anything else? It's the relationship that you have with your spouse and your children and then to other people. Relationships are the deepest, most important thing in your life. Our church exists to bind those relationships eternally in covenant relationship with God and one another. That is the heart and soul of our doctrine in the church. And when you undermine the temple and you undermine Brigham Young and you undermine the ceiling and all of that stuff, which is in section 132 is when we're talking about families and, and, and being bound on earth and in heaven and all the details of that. When you throw that out the window, you throw out the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ and you throw out the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yeah, I would add, That's I, I think that's great. I think that's very well stated. I think I would add one more thing, and that is the undermining of the family. And it's, you know, we don't 
talk about that as much as we used to. I, I'm doing an episode right now on on Julie Beck, uh, Relief Society, General Relief Society president back 10, 15 years ago, 15 years ago. And, and uh, you know, she's the one who came out and said, if it's anti-family, it's anti-Christ. Amen. And, and it's, uh, I don't know that this talk would be given anymore today. <laughs> I don't know. It worries me because as we undermine the idea of a traditional family, for cultural trends, then then we are actually undermining the temple and, and we are undermining the plain and precious things, as you've stated, that have been restored and that are unique to the church. And as Sister Beck says, we are undermining Christ and the entire reason for the atonement. That is the purpose. Our The reason for the atonement is not for you to not be guilty right, and feel guilty about something. The reason for the atonement is to, to, to drive a stronger relationship, a covenantal relationship with Christ and with our Heavenly Father, and to create families for exaltation. When we start removing the idea and the doctrines of family and, and exaltation, which are not spoken of as much anymore in our Sunday school classes and in our uh, uh, you know, elders quorum and young women's classes, etc., or from the pulpit in sacrament meeting, then, then we are undermining everything that has been restored with Joseph Smith. Yeah, I, I it's funny because what happens is that they redefine the terms. This is the way that a family is just, it's just, you know, people that like love each other, right? Like anyone can be your family. That's not family as defined. Christ all the way into the Bible, it is, he creates Adam and Eve. It's about man and woman and child. That is what a family is. It's the unit that allows for the propagation of life itself. Okay. That is something deeply sacred and ideal in the eyes of God. It is part of the celestial order. Okay. Okay. Man, woman, child, that is the celestial order. That is why we have a proclamation on the family that talks about that and defines family in that way. Then what do they want to redefine? You want to redefine what a marriage is. Remember, a marriage, I, this is one of the questions I like to ask people. What is a marriage? Well, they say, well, it's like two people that like make a commitment to each other for the rest of their life. That is fundamentally a different thing than saying a man-woman union of male and female for the creation of family. Because that's what that's what God intended to mean by it. That's what he means by it. Okay. And if we want to go and talk about, well, I have a marriage, but it's something totally different than what God has ordained. Well, I don't care. That thing is just you guys making promises to each other. Nice, nice romantic gesture, but it's not the same thing. And by I'm the way, that could be heterosexual. What was that? Also. That could be heterosexual also. I mean, if you if if the, the marriage is for building a family. There are a lot of people today, and you see them out on TikTok, and now they're just talking about how wonderful it is that we're never going to have kids. You know, we're, we're, we're going against this. That is not a true marriage, according to the order of God. I mean, it the isn't, whole purpose it, of that is to have a family and take on that responsibility. They are literally, they're describing something different. We're not talking about the same thing. This is where linguistic confusion messes everything up. When you start to just say, well, a marriage is something other, it's like, I'm not talking about that. When I'm talking about a marriage, I'm talking about a male and a female getting together in order to, with the intention to have children. Now, oh, but what about those who are infertile? This is something that gets handled in the plan of salvation. They will eventually have a posterity, but the intrinsic nature of the union is different if it's not male, female, because it doesn't allow for the propagation literally of biological life, let alone the spiritual dynamic of the masculine and feminine being joined. And then you want to redefine gender even. Like now male and female are, are reduced to meaningless concepts. And what this does is, as you're pointing out, it breaks down the family. It breaks down the celestial order, which is the ideal order. Now, I want to say this to those who, who, and I know people and have people that, you know, that are gay and that are in a union with another gay person. Okay. I may believe that those actually are better than the alternative of someone going out and living a hedonistic sexual life. Okay. I, I, I can actually say that that is a better thing. All right. But when I'm talking about. Well, there's about, some commitment and, and responsibility there. Absolutely. 
And I and 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 so I I can actually be happy for someone that they've moved to that. It's not ideal though, right? What is the ideal? What is the celestial order? Anyone who says that anything less than marriage is an ideal is just they don't understand like no, the ideal is man, woman, child, literally because, and I mean this, we just take the religion off the table. That's what allows for the propagation of life and the continuation of, if you think life is worth it, this is, if you're going to say, again, I'm not, you don't have to hate something because it's not ideal, but you can say that this is higher than that. Okay. In the church, I tell people this, the church is like the club of people who are dedicated to the ideal saying, we want to go to the celestial order and so everything we do in the church is designed to that end. Now, there are other paths people can take that may take them to a kingdom of glory, but it's not going to take them to the highest level of glory that's possible. Yeah, and, and uh, that that's the issue, though. It, it, that's exactly the issue. That's something I talk about all the time is that, that you can't give up the ideal. And we're starting to do that within the church. Right, because we're, what we do is we break it down. We pull down the ideal to make everything even, and everything's the same, and everyone's included, right, in in the same idea. As we just change, as you say, we change the definitions of marriage and family and everything else. It's like, no, look, I I grew up. My parents divorced when I was six years old. I did not grow up in an ideal situation, right? My you now great parents. They're both de were dedicated to the church, but they they just couldn't handle each other. And, and so, you know, I, I had a, my dad afterward, a couple of years later, got married again, had four more kids. There were seven of us total. You don't, it's not the ideal situation, but you know what? We tried to make it the ideal. You still strive toward the ideal. You still teach the ideal. You know, I, that, that is, that is what was, I, you know, I am so grateful to my parents because regardless of whether or not they had the ideal, they still held on to it. Yep. And they still said, look, this is what you need to do. This is what the ideal is. That's the great challenge. The great challenge of ideals is we all realize we fall short of them. And I want to say to those who don't fall into the ideal of a, of a sexual orientation or something like that, fine. Guess what? We all have, I, I'm a sinner too. I fall short of all sorts of ideals. In fact, one of the things I hate is when people want, they want to do one of two things. They want to say, well, I meet the ideal. So I'm good. Like I'm, I'm righteous. I'm cool. Or they say that I don't meet the ideal, so that must not be the ideal. It's not the ideal for me, mm. right? And so this is, again, where you, again, the celestial order is to say that there is an ideal. And to strive for that ideal, even when you don't, that's that's our thing. That's what a Christian does. They say, look, I'm a sinner, Lord. I don't measure up to the ideal in 50 million different ways. But I'm not giving up on that. I'll take you, Lord, as far as you want to take me. I will never justify myself because I can't do that. Yeah, that's it's like it's, that's what you're you learn in Moses one, right? Moses is called by name by God, but then as he sees everything and what what the whole glory of God is, he's like, I am nothing. I am like less than the dust of the earth. And yet back again, God comes back again and talks to him and he calls him again by name, right? Giving him his significance as a son of God. It's like, look, these two things exist at the same time. You are nothing, but you're also everything. And, yep. and you have to be able to accept both of those. It's, that's the, why do you think the gospel is called the good news? The, mm -hmm. the, 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 go, the gospel doesn't mean anything until you, the, you don't realize what salvation means until you know what the fall means. Until you realize what the ideal is and that you fall short of it, and you don't, it, it's, Christ is saying, hey, you fall short of the ideal, but here's the good news. If you keep trying and you don't give up on this ideal, I'll take you as far as you'll let me take you. And it's only us that decide we're, we want to abandon the ideal. And so in, in all of this, um, there is a... Um, we, and to take this back kind of to the polygamy thing, again, when you sacrifice the temple and when you sacrifice these covenants, you end up sacrificing the ideals behind those and the things that actually bind us together. I, I like to say that 
I like to use this analogy of, of a, uh, an orchestra, right? Well, people will say, well, I, I just want to play my own instrument. It's like, okay, fine. Go be a hedonist. You can play your own instrument, but you're all by yourself. Ultimately, if you want to play with other people, you have to harmonize your relationships. And what the gospel is designed to do is to harmonize us into a great orchestra. Yes, we all have different instruments. We all have different talents. We are diverse, but it's the unity of the music and the conductor and playing the song to the best of our ability. That's ultimately what brings us to exaltation. That is the great, see, I hate the idea that, well, it doesn't work for me. It's like, well, maybe it's not about you. Maybe it's about all of us. Maybe what needs to work isn't what works just for you. Because if I just do what I think works for me, you do what works for you, you get chaos. You don't get families. You don't get social harmony. But you know what happens? What if we asked, what, is there something out there? Is there a moral truth? Is there an order of being that works best for everyone? Not only for me, but for my children, for my wife, for my community, for my nation, and not only in this generation, but through all generations of time. And that's what the gospel is trying to teach us are the principles of that way of being. Now, within that order, there's variation. There's, you know, you have your own interests. You're not commanded in all things. We're all different. That's all fine. But there's this underlying order that we don't want to get beyond because it messes everything up. It creates, it's like, we're trying to play this song. We all have our own instruments. We all have our own kind of way of playing our instrument, you know, a little better at this or a little better at that. But there's still a song that we got to play. And if we start just going off and saying, I want to do whatever I want, you mess up the song. And not only that, if everyone does that, you just have chaos and noise. So when people begin to understand that in our plan of salvation, we have these different levels, these orders of being, and the church is designed to say there is an ideal order and we want to invite everyone that is willing to, to live that order. That's the celestial kingdom. Those are the people who want that. And the people who don't, who want some other order that's less than ideal, they can pursue that and they can get as much as that order will give them, but it won't give them the highest. Yeah. Well, I hope that, you know, we can... <laughs> we have got to anchor ourselves as a people into in into the scriptures into the temple into family we cannot go there is a reason why you can't go along with culture you're going to lose all of these things that provide that order this that's what the order is all about and and it's always been this way you know it's always been this way going back to the time of adam it's not something new with brigham young Right, it is. It's always existed. I'm I'm going uh, in three days. I, I go I go to Egypt, and and you walk around the ruins there, and you see what's on the walls, and you're like, holy cow! This is this is the freaking endowment. This is everywhere, right? This is this is not something Joseph Smith made up. Yeah. Here's the Abrahamic covenant listed right here. Here is the ritual embrace. Here are the degrees of progression going through the temple the, here's the garb that they're wearing and what it represented you know given by third party egyptologists that are that talk about the priests in the temple it's yep. it's so blatantly in your face yep uh, you're like this is this is not Brigham Young well what's interesting and it's not this, Joseph Smith you're right but what's really wild is is that Joseph Smith only developed those things up to a certain point. And it was Brigham Young who Joseph Smith said that he said, hey, I, I want you to kind of systematize and continue yeah, this project. Yeah, he assigned it. Yeah. And here's what's wild. He did. What has emerged through the prophets that we have is a real temple ritual that coincides, like you said, with all sorts of scriptural themes throughout all of time. This is something much bigger, as you said, than Joseph or Brigham. And that when you see the continuity of that into the church today, it's another reason and evidence to say this, this is it. Like we really have restored something 
big. This idea that I've just put forth of these orders of being and, and family sort of relationships being at the heart of, or just relationships with human beings, family being the, the highest level of that order of human relationships, um, that that being at the center of our theology, that that isn't a new concept. That this has actually been the point the whole time. And when we think about it, there's something deeply intuitive that says, of course it is. What is more important to us than the people that we love? And what could be higher to God if he says the first thing is love me so that you can then love your neighbors in the right way? Like you can actually love them because I'll teach you how to love them and what that's supposed to look like. Yeah. And it's it's the most like profound thing. It's like everything snaps into place. It's like, oh, God isn't some narcissist who really, really wants us in there to like bow at his feet for eternity. He's trying to bring us into right relationship with him and with one another, starting with the people who I care about more than anyone in the world. And I just am like, that's beautiful. That's like, what could be more true than that? Like this is getting right to the things that really are at the center of my heart. And at the, I think at the heart of every every person, and I just find it incredible that we have that. And to say that now nah, all the stuff that Brigham made up and the temples and idol and, and, you know, these covenants, they're just kind of unnecessary. It's like, you're just, you're missing the point. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, Jacob. I really appreciate what you guys, what you do over there on Thoughtful Faith. Uh, great debate you had rec- recently with uh, Pines with, a, of a, with Pints With, is it? Yeah, so it was on Pints with Aquinas with Pint, Trent Horn, who yeah. has his own own show. Yeah, yeah, great, great debate. You did a fabulous job. And uh, so anyway, where, where can people find you? Uh, easiest place, just on YouTube. Uh, you can just go to Thoughtful Faith. But I also have a website, uh, thoughtfulfaith.org. And on there, I also, just so people know, if you ever wanted to get involved and help kind of volunteer in some of this stuff, I do have a Get Involved uh, area where you can kind of let me know what you might be able to do to help the channel. Um, and I'd appreciate that as well. That's, that's always a, a great thing for people to do. Great, Jacob. Appreciate you and all you're doing and uh, keep going. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg.